Following up Final Fantasy with a sequel was never going to be an easy task. The original performed really well both critically and financially, and it quickly turned into Square's flagship title, to the point where everything they ever made before it quickly drifted into obscurity. It was a huge leap forward for RPGs, leaving players both satisfied and wanting more. From a business standpoint, a sequel was just an inevitability. But from a creative standpoint, I can only imagine that at first it seemed like a complete impossibility. Final Fantasy is not a game that lends itself to a sequel at all. Story-wise, there wasn't much of anything to go off of, with no characters and a world that had already found balance. The party from the original game had already completed their journey and grown powerful. Starting from scratch with the same party wouldn't have made any sense. It's a tricky standpoint to approach making a game from, so it shouldn't be too surprising that Square ended up taking a pretty radical approach with Final Fantasy II. When I covered the original Final Fantasy, I had already finished it and formed an opinion on it years before I ever started recording footage for the project. With this game though, I had never actually finished it before starting this video. I had tried the game before, but I only made it a few hours in before ultimately putting it down. So all of the footage you'll see throughout this video is basically my first playthrough. Why did I drop the game in the first place? Well, that's something I'll get into later. At the time of its release, FF2 was generally received quite positively, once again reviewing and selling really well. However, something strange has happened over time. While the original Final Fantasy is still considered a hugely important classic in the genre, its sequel has gradually slipped further and further away from that spotlight. The original title is revered as influential and pioneering, while 2 is disgraced. At this point, it's commonly considered one of, if not the weakest title in the entire Final Fantasy series, sometimes even being called one of the worst RPGs of all time. And it's a game that modern players aren't likely to touch unless they're specifically trying to play every single mainline installment. Part of that may have to do with the game's strange release in the West. While the original game got a full translation and localization from the Japanese Famicom to the American NES, FF2 never received that same treatment. There were plans to originally, but it was ultimately cancelled as attention was shifting towards the Super Nintendo by that point, so the Final Fantasy II that we received over here was actually what Japan knew as Final Fantasy IV. Not only has this title scheme caused plenty of confusion over the years, but it's had the effect of essentially wiping Final Fantasy II from the Western market for years. When the game finally did come overseas, it was well removed from its original context. That's definitely not the only reason for the game's decline in popularity, though, as review scores have also declined over the decades in Japan as well. So just what is it about Final Fantasy II that, in the eyes of so many, has aged so poorly? Just to get this out of the way, FF2 has also been re-released a notorious amount of times, but that's mainly because it's always been re-released alongside the first game. Every time FF1 got a major re-release, 2 was sure to get one made in the exact same style. This means that all of the versions and changes I covered in the last video are generally applicable here as well, and just like before, the Pixel Remaster is what I played for this video. The general approach for the original Famicom release of FF2 seemed to be to build off the foundation of the original while innovating in completely different areas. Where the original game had a revolutionary sense of presentation, the sequel essentially does the same thing as last time. Everything is styled pretty much exactly the same here, and the key figures behind the presentation of the original game, more specifically the main artist Yoshi Taka Amano and the composer Nobuo Uematsu, reprise their roles. This is still a Famicom game on a cartridge with the same data limitations as before, so everyone involved was working with the same rule sets as the first game. So while the foundation is very much the same, this is still clearly a team working with more experience than before. The game itself does look just slightly better this time around as a result of the team's experience, and I think this is best showcased through the battle screen. Gone are the boxes separating key points of the battle, it's now a seamless screen with all key visual information shown on the same plane. There's also new animations for entering and leaving the battle screen that just didn't exist before. They are minor improvements, but they still elevate the game's visuals just that little bit more. Still, this is quite a primitive looking game, so external aids once again do most of the heavy lifting when it comes to the game's visual identity. In this regard, Amano's artwork maintains the same unique elegance as before, and it looks just as great as it ever did. I especially love the game's box art, which showcases Firion with the blood sword. This art helped the last game to create more of a vivid image of the world in the player's head, and it fills very much the same role with the sequel. The soundtrack, in my opinion, is really fantastic this time, and it's a big upgrade all around. 
I already discussed the limitations behind Famicom Music in my last video, so I won't bother going into all of that again, but I'm just going to showcase one comparison between the original soundtrack and the new remastered one, because I feel like the improvement here is especially vast, even when compared to other remastered soundtracks in the series. The Pixel Remaster fully realizes the potential of the original songs, and because of this I really feel confident in saying that Final Fantasy II has one of the better soundtracks in this series. It takes a more active role in setting the tone in this installment, and it gives the whole game a sense of grandiosity alongside somberness. This is best shown in the overworld theme which rather than being upbeat and adventurous, is oppressed but determined. The battle theme here maintains the same baseline as before, but twists it into a piece that constantly feels dangerous and on edge. Another standout is the Rebel Army theme, which serves as one of the few pieces of genuine hope in an otherwise vicious world. Another one of my favorite themes in the game is the Pandemonium theme, which serves to really drive home the desperation and intensity in the climax of the game. I could go on and on explaining what makes every single song in the game so great, but just to keep things short, I'll just say that I really love the soundtrack here. So yes, on the surface, Final Fantasy II looks extremely similar to the first game. Past the aesthetics though, this is an incredibly different game from its predecessor in just about every way imaginable. It may look similar, but in terms of mechanics, aspirations, and especially story, FF2 is an extremely distinct title. The game makes this clear pretty much immediately through its very opening moments. Where the original game had you choosing your party's classes and naming each character, this one opens with four pre-named character sprites, each with their own unique designs that don't adhere to any particular class. After that, you're shown an opening cutscene that details specific kingdoms and shows the background to a much more purposeful narrative, which serves as a huge contrast from the first game's very general overview. After that cutscene, you're thrown into a battle, but this battle isn't like any encounter from the first game. It's scripted. Not only that, but it's scripted for you to lose, as your party gets brutally attacked by these knights who do ridiculous amounts of damage. So right off the bat, the game showcases a clear difference in aspirations from its predecessor. The first game left much of the story up to the player's discretion. There was a basic plot, but as far as characters and overall development went, that was all pretty much up to your imagination. From its very opening moments, though, Final Fantasy II is a hard pivot into more direct storytelling. Throughout the game, you're directed from scripted sequence to scripted sequence, with each section directly contributing to the overarching story. Characters have canon names and speak in scenes with actual dialogue, which is something that never happened before. There's plenty of more cinematic moments throughout the game as well. There's multiple major events here with pretty memorable imagery. Even boss fights, which often came out of nowhere previously, are typically built up to here with much more grandness. A great example is the Behemoth fight, which is introduced with this cutscene. <laughs> 
So the storytelling here is much more present and involved than before, and that's one of FF2's greatest ambitions. But how is the story itself? Well, the first thing I'd like to commend the story for is its distinct tonal identity from the first game. The original Final Fantasy is a very lighthearted game. There's danger, but you never feel like there's really anything at stake. The emphasis is instead on adventure and the fun that comes with that. And I mentioned this a bit earlier when I was talking about the soundtrack, but the music is reflective of the story as a whole. Final Fantasy II is a shockingly somber game that is not afraid to show death around every corner. Yet it still refuses to let its world succumb to bleakness and despair. There is a rebellion actively fighting for a better tomorrow throughout the entire story, and this undying hope breathes life into the dangerous world. The world in general has significantly more character than the world of the first game, which is something that I find really impressive. Kingdoms and towns feel separate and defined with more diverse designs and details. It never felt like two places completely blended in. It may be the bare minimum for today's standards, but it's worth remembering how much of a leap forward this was for the time. Unfortunately, all of this impressive set dressing feels wasted on a plot that just isn't super interesting. Most of it can be boiled down to a fantasy-themed Star Wars ripoff. You have an evil empire, a protagonist whose family is killed by the empire, a rebellion, a princess leading that rebellion, a giant ship with the potential to destroy entire settlements, an evil Dark Knight, an evil emperor secretly pulling the strings behind the Dark Knight. I mean, I could go on and on with comparisons, but I think you get the picture by now. It's so blatant that I can't help but assume it's intentional, and I guess there is something to be said for wearing your influences on your sleeves, but I think the story here is ultimately killed by the barebones script which contains next to nothing in terms of personality. Characters here basically all speak in the exact same voice, except for Guy who speaks Beaver, and none of them have any distinct personality traits. I can tell you that Ferion is the protagonist, or that Maria is his companion, or that Hilda is the princess leading the rebellion, but past those surface level bullet points, I couldn't tell you anything about how they act, what's important to them, anything like that. Literally the sole exception to this is that guy speaks beaver, and somehow I don't get the impression that that is what the team behind the game was hoping that I would take away from this. I'm caught in the middle on the story in this game. I think its sheer existence is really impressive given the context of the game's release, I love the efforts made to give it a unique somber tone, and I really appreciate how it pushed the bar for storytelling in video games. But on the other hand, it is shallow in every sense of the word, completely unable to provide any sense of depth beyond the most paper-thin service level, and it fails to be remotely compelling in any way. Overall, I think I can cut this down to it being a relic of its time. It's something interesting to look back on to see how far we've come, but it doesn't really provide all that much genuine value today outside of that. The most important thing here, though, is the effort, and the ambition was clearly there, so that's not something that I want to take away from it. However, the story wasn't the only area in which Final Fantasy II decided to take a radically different approach from its predecessor. By far the biggest overhaul of the game comes in the RPG mechanics. You may remember in the last video, this was an area where I criticized the original Final Fantasy, as the RPG mechanics in that game are just about as bare bones as they come, past the unique choice of your party composition at the very beginning of the game. That absolutely cannot be said for FF2, which comes with a total mechanical overhaul so robust that it single-handedly makes or breaks the game for many. There is a lot to talk about here, so I'll start with the leveling system, which is by far the biggest change here. Traditional level-ups are completely absent in FF2, and in their place are skill levels. So instead of one experience bar going up per character, there are essentially dozens for each character that all level independently of each other, and they're each assigned to a specific attribute. These all level up the more that they're used, so for example, the more you use a sword, the more you'll increase your proficiency level with swords, and this also applies to shields and every other weapon type. This also applies to things like magic, so each spell has to be leveled individually, and they get stronger the more that you level them. So tiered magic is completely gone, as well as the spell charges from the last game, and in their place is a new MP system. The amount of magic you can use is now dictated through just one number, but each spell detracts from that number. You can use every spell indiscriminately, but once your MP hits zero, you can't use magic anymore until you restore it with an item like an Aether. It's able to stay balanced by making spells cost more MP the more powerful they are. And since there is no way to level up traditionally, once again, HP and MP are also increased through use. So the more damage you take, the more your HP goes up. Although this will also just randomly go up from time to time. And the more magic you use, the higher your MP gets. 
That last part actually solves one of my biggest issues with the last game, where you could never really utilize magic to its fullest potential because spell charges were so limited. Here, if you want to use magic frequently, your MP will level up super quickly, and you can regularly use it in battle if you want to. The key point there being if you want to. I mentioned earlier how you don't get to choose your class at the start of the game, but that doesn't mean that you don't get to assign your character's roles in the party. In fact, there's actually way more freedom you have when it comes to deciding what you want each of your party members to do. Any party member can be equipped with any equipment or magic you want, and they'll become proficient in these categories as a result. So you can really choose any role that you want for any of these characters, and none of it has to adhere to predetermined class roles. In the last game, if you wanted a character efficient in healing magic, it had to be a white mage, but that left offensive options super slim. Here, you can level up proficiency with healing magic and also train up a physical weapon alongside that to make sure that they can still deal out damage when appropriate. Red mages in the last game couldn't reach the full potential of black or white magic, but here if you're dedicated enough to spellcasting, you can absolutely have both extremely powerful with no compromises on either side. And that's just a few examples. Even if you're not creative at all and just want to mold everyone into specific pre-existing class archetypes, you can do that too. In terms of player freedom when it comes to team composition, Final Fantasy II blows the first game out of the water. So if it's not obvious already, I ended up really enjoying this level system. I thought it was a really good way to keep me engaged since I was always playing the long game in my head and planning how I wanted my party to look by the end of it all, but also I never felt like I was locked into any specific path. For example, at the start of the game, I planned to have Maria use a bow while focusing primarily on magic attacks, but eventually I realized that it was actually way more efficient to level her skill attached to attacking with her bare hands, so that way she had the strength of a monk and that wasn't interfering with her magic casting at all. That discovery felt awesome, and it's just one example of the times where I felt empowered by the immense freedom that this level system offered me. As important as this level system is, there's lots of other new mechanics surrounding it, most of it having to do with the equipment itself. First off, there's a lot more variety in weapons now. You've got everything from the last game as well as a healthy variety of new additions, so that means your standard swords, axes, and staves, but also spears, bows, even shields. Uh, when it comes to actually equipping these to your characters, there's no standard weapon slot, but instead one slot for a character's left hand and another for their right hand. So here's where choices start to really get interesting. You can fill one of these hands with a shield so you have a higher chance at avoiding attacks entirely, or you can use a dual-handed weapon that typically does more damage than a normal one. That's another system new to this game, certain weapons will only take up one equipment slot while others will take up both of them. And even that ignores a third option of dual-wielding single-handed weapons. This essentially lets you attack twice in one turn and get tons of damage in at the cost of taking more hits. You can also have nothing equipped and just use your bare hands, or two shields for maximum evasion. This is yet another area in which Final Fantasy II took the simple foundation from the first game and cracked it wide open to allow for extreme freedom when it comes to composing your party. The game does employ a pretty creative mechanic to attempt to balance this system. It's called Magic Interference. Basically, the more gear you have equipped, the more magic interference you'll build up, which essentially means that your magic casts will get weaker and weaker. This stops your characters from becoming too overpowered, which is appreciated, and it also made me just that bit more considerate when I was planning out how I wanted to build my party. One last addition to party building here comes in the form of the front and back row system. It really is as simple as it sounds, you can either place party members in the front or the back. The front row deals more damage at the cost of also taking more damage, and the back row lowers damage taken while also lowering your own damage output, at least from physical attacks. I found this kinda useful in the beginning, but to be honest, it didn't take too long for me to realize that it was pretty much pointless to have anyone in the back row. Since taking damage raised everyone's HP, I found it better in the long run to just take the hits and have a whole party full of tanky characters by the end of the game. In fact, that's a common recurring theme that I find with Final Fantasy II. The mechanics are fairly complicated, at least relative to its era, but they're also not the best thought out. One example that springs to mind has to do with all of the weapons. There's plenty of options, but the best weapons in the game are typically swords and axes, and that leaves certain weapons like knives and spears with no apparent use since they're no different in function to the more powerful swords and axes. So why waste all of your time leveling spear proficiency when in the long run it's better to put all of that into a sword instead? If those weapons had some kind of special ability, that could have helped give them their own unique use, but as it is, I don't see any reason to dedicate time to them. Some weapons, like bows or staves, are a bit closer to figuring out the balancing act, but they're still not quite there. 
These weapons have extraordinarily low magic interference, so the idea is that you can build up your magic more effectively with characters wielding those weapons at the cost of dealing less physical damage. Except, like I said earlier, you can drop weapons entirely and just build up bare hand skills, and not only does that mean that there's no magic interference, but it also means that you can have sufficiently high damage with no trade-off. I should also note that even though the mechanics involving equipment are radically different from the first game, the shop screen does not treat it that way. It recommends weapons based on damage values and absolutely nothing else, meaning if a spear does slightly more damage than a sword, the shop will recommend that spear over your current sword. This doesn't really work because the effectiveness of weapons is highly reliant on your proficiency level with them, something that this screen completely ignores. So even if your spear level is 1 and your sword level is 16, it will still recommend the spear, even though it would result in a massive damage loss. It's not really a huge issue, it's just obnoxious when you're looking over potential weapons and having to consciously ignore the information that the game is shoving in your face. I've praised the RPG mechanics in this game for encouraging experimentation, but I will say that by the end of the game, you're pretty much locked in. Experience points can't be transferred between areas in any way, so unless you want to grind up one specific ability to reach endgame standards, you're kinda stuck in the path that you set for yourself. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's worth noting that experimentation does become a lot less enticing the further into the game you get. Magic isn't really all that balanced either. I mentioned earlier how you get more powerful magic by just leveling it up, and that's fine and everything, but it means that you can't cast the same spell at multiple tiers of power. In the last game, you got more powerful magic by just purchasing it at a shop, but your less powerful version would always still be available in the lower tiers. Sometimes it's just nice to have a weaker version of a spell on hand because it doesn't cost as much, and sometimes it's overkill to put your full force into a standard enemy who could easily be taken out in one hit with a much weaker spell. I think this issue could have been fixed by retaining the magic scaling system of the previous game, and instead of leveling up each spell individually, level up magic use as a whole. And this also would have fixed another issue I have with the magic in this game, that being that the leveling system essentially forces you to constantly be using it even when there isn't really a need for it. If you want your spells to be powerful when it comes time for boss battles, especially late in the game, you either need to have been using them regularly, or you'll need to stop and grind them up. All these spells start out useless, just pitifully weak, so even in standard encounters you're not likely to get far at all unless you've already leveled up your magic. But that requires having used it in multiple other battles up to that point where it wouldn't have been useful at all. You see the issue here. This whole magic issue even affects the story at one point. There's this big quest in the middle of the game to achieve this all-powerful spell called Ultima, and there's a whole dungeon leading up to it, it's a pretty big deal. And then you finally learn the thing, and it's a level 1 spell, which means it does practically no damage whatsoever when you first learn it. It's pretty late in the game when you get this thing too, so either you grind it all the way up to a point where it would be legitimately useful, or you just give up and use your other more powerful spells which were probably doing a pretty good job of carrying you through the game up to that point. It just feels so anticlimactic and poorly thought out. So many of the RPG mechanics in this game are dedicated to letting you build your party with a long-term goal. I don't have any issues with this approach, and I think it ultimately suits the game very well, but there's one major snag I have in regards to all of this. It only applies to your main three party members, those being Firion, Maria, and Guy. The fourth party member, well, you may have noticed throughout the video that the fourth party member is actually taken up by multiple different characters that rotate throughout the game for story reasons. So you're not going to want to spend any kind of significant time making a plan for these characters, because they all leave before you get the chance to do anything with them. This is made worse when you realize that the vast majority of these guys are pretty weak, or at least they start out that way, but again, they can't really make any significant progress before they leave you for good. Minwoo's pretty strong, but he's the exception. The rest of these guys end up feeling more like dead weight that you have to carry. Having the fourth party member constantly rotate is such a baffling choice because it's at direct odds with what seemed to be the main goal of the game mechanically. I really don't understand why they did this. I wish they just had a fixed party member. It would make so much more sense with the game's established ambitions and provide an even wider canvas when it comes to party building. The current system just feels weirdly restrictive. Okay, so there are a ton of holes you can point out with Final Fantasy II mechanically. It's definitely not the most well thought out game, and it's not exactly the most well balanced either. But still, when viewed as a whole picture, I think it ends up working out. It feels like a rough concept, I have to admit, but I think all of these systems do get across the feeling of freedom they were obviously going for here. With more fine tuning, this could have been something really cool. And I think the concept has ultimately proved itself worthy of praise, going on to inspire Square's own saga series and even the extremely popular Elder Scrolls series. 
Here, in its most primitive form, it just barely cuts it. The game was just too ambitious for its time, but I'd much rather have something like this actively trying to be interesting and unique than shamelessly rehashing the mechanics of the last game. I do genuinely really like what they were going for here, and I think at its core, it works. It kept me engaged and actively working towards my own goals, which was clearly the intent. So even if it didn't 100% stick the landing, I think it does its job well enough. Now that we finally have all of the mechanical talk out of the way, we can move on to the underlying game underneath all of that. This is the main area that actually is remarkably similar to the original Final Fantasy. Hopping in between towns and dungeons, traversing the overworld, fighting random encounters, structurally, it's all very familiar to anyone who played the first game. There are a few notable differences from last time though, the first of which you'll run into after just a few minutes. Passwords. Passwords are essentially this game's attempt to further incentivize you to talk with every NPC you can. Every once in a while, you'll notice a word or phrase in red font, and you can ask about it to get further clarification on whatever it is they're talking about. You'll then learn this word or phrase and can go around asking anyone about it and seeing if they have any different perspective on it. I see what they were going for in concept, but in execution, it kind of falls flat. It's just really limited in scope and it doesn't really lead to any interesting interactions or rewards that make me feel like interacting with the system is worth it. Maybe it would help if I liked the story more so I would be more invested to learn more about it, but as it is, I don't get much out of these extra chunks of text, and it's not like there's many opportunities for it anyway. Most of these interactions lead to nothing, with only a select few yielding any kind of extra dialogue at all, and there was only one time in the whole game I felt like I got a substantial reward out of it. Most of the time, its only purpose is to arbitrarily lock progression behind a certain keyword, which doesn't really add anything other than like 10 seconds of confusion as you're trying to figure out where to go next. I get the intent of wanting to make NPC interactions more dynamic, but this didn't do anything to solve that issue in my opinion. The main draw to talking to NPCs in the first place is to learn more about the world and get hints on where to go next, and the first game did both of these things just fine, so I think they would have been better off just sticking with the more basic interactions even if they are one-sided. Aside from that, you'll probably notice pretty quickly that Final Fantasy II is far grander in scale than the original ever was. I've already mentioned how the story and mechanics are greatly expanded, so they definitely have a lot to do with that feeling, but it's also apparent through the sheer size of the world map this time around. It's definitely bigger than the first and can honestly feel a bit overwhelming at first, though you'll realize it's not too bad after you get your bearings. Whenever you really need to get across a large chunk of land, you can go find a chocobo, a creature new to FF2 which can help you move across the world map at a much greater pace than usual, and while you're on one, you don't even have to worry about random encounters. Something else that goes into all of this is the scale of the numbers. You've seen it throughout the footage, it doesn't take long at all for the numbers to get huge in this game, much bigger than the first game ever allowed. A few hours in and all of your characters will have hit the quadruple digits in both HP and typical damage output from attacks, leaving you feeling much more powerful than you ever did last time, but also leaving your enemies feeling more dangerous than ever before. Speaking of enemies, I think this is a good chance to bring up combat. In my video on the first game, I heavily criticized the game's low difficulty and mindless battles, so how do I think this one stacks up in that regard? Honestly, not all that much better. For all its mechanical depth, when it comes down to the heat of battle, Final Fantasy II can still easily be conquered without employing any kind of significant tactics for the vast majority of standard battles. Battles retain the turn-based structure of the last game and don't really have anything new to offer. But I'm much more okay with that this time around. A big part of that is because of all of the new RPG mechanics. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm always playing the long game in my head and I'm always thinking about how my actions in the current battle will affect my character's growth going forward. We're still far from ideal territory here, but credit where credit is due, I think the RPG mechanics carry their weight and ultimately downplay the significance of what was one of the first game's biggest shortcomings. But that doesn't mean the battles aren't an issue at all here, because unfortunately I still found the game far too easy in general, especially early on. Just a few hours in, I was already overpowering enemies so badly that my combat skills flat out stopped increasing until I started encountering stronger ones. It felt almost comical. So many boss fights would feel anticlimactic because they would die so quickly when in my head I was preparing for a much longer and more intensive battle. And combine all of this with the ability to craft your team precisely how you want it? If you know how to play your cards right, you can absolutely decimate enemies in this game. It's just not balanced properly to be a rewarding experience in battles, and that's still a huge issue. I'll still maintain that the game is easy, but that doesn't mean that I had a completely smooth ride through the game either. No, when the game wants to get on your nerves, it will get on your nerves. By far the biggest offenders here are the dungeons. You thought these were obnoxious in the first game, they are back with a vengeance. Dungeons in this game are terrible. 
Once again, these feel designed to waste as much of your time as possible, but there's so much more blatant about it this time. I can't even count the amount of times I reached a section where there were multiple doors to go through, and every single one of them led me to an empty room except for the one that would actually let me progress. Especially once you get to the final parts of the game and the dungeons start getting super long, these aren't fun at all. And I mentioned that the battles are typically pretty easy, which is true, but even these start to be aggravating by the end of the game. You start encountering enemies that just love to shower you with status effects, and it's not difficult to take care of these, it's just frustrating because you want to move ahead already. Malboros are especially obnoxious with these, but nothing compares to the Coerls. These are awful. Every single standard attack from them is a guaranteed instant kill, and the only other move they have stuns you. It became so obvious so quickly that it's not worth fighting these guys. I just started running away every single time I saw one. Final Fantasy II is longer than the first game by a decent amount, and that can definitely be seen as a good thing for some. But those last few hours seriously tested my patience, and by the time I reached that final cutscene, it felt more like a sigh of relief than a triumph. And it sucks because FF2 is so close to being a legitimately good game in so many aspects. I have so much respect for its willingness to immediately defy expectations, and I love how unashamed it is to be radically different from its predecessor while still maintaining the core ideas that made that game such a runaway success at the time. But it just totally shoots itself in the foot when it comes to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay in the back half of the game, and for that reason I just can't recommend it. It's easy to knock FF2 for a lot of things, and I've even done it myself a lot in this video, but still, I don't think this game's negative reputation is entirely deserved. I've avoided bringing this up until now, but for so many people, it's too easy to write the game off as the one where you hit yourself to win. Because of the way HP leveling works, it didn't take long at all for people to discover that inflicting damage on yourself is the fastest way to have your health skyrocket. And as a result, the balance of the entire game is thrown off immediately, and you're consistently overleveled at every turn. This strategy spread like wildfire, and now it's a running gag within the Final Fantasy fanbase. It's what I did when I first picked up the game a few years back, and it's exactly why I became disinterested so fast. So when I returned to the game for this video, I purposely avoided that strategy entirely. And what I found was a game that I was able to comfortably get through without needing to use it once, or even having to stop to grind a single time. I never felt too obscenely underpowered or overpowered. The game is unbalanced, but not to the degree that some make it out to be. I don't think this is a terrible game by any means, and definitely nowhere near one of the worst JRPGs ever made or anything like that. It's just an overly ambitious Famicom game. It may go on for a bit too long and it may be unbalanced, but Final Fantasy II is still a remarkably important game, much more so than people typically give it credit for. When this game's legacy is brought up within the larger scope of the series, people will typically mention how this was the first game to include chocobos, or the first one to have a character named Sid who's an airship engineer. And yeah, all of that is true, but fans of the series so often ignore just how crucial this very first sequel was on a much grander scale. In carving a unique and ambitious identity for itself, it set the foundation for the rest of the series to come. This franchise is so vast and far removed from its primitive days that it's easy to forget that FF2 was the game that decided that every Final Fantasy sequel would have a completely new world, story, set of characters, even gameplay mechanics. It was the first game that firmly decided that going forward, innovation and change was the top priority for the series. It was the game that decided that ambitious storytelling has a place in video games. It was the game that took on the immense challenge of looking at what came before and adapting its best qualities into a unique experience. Every single Final Fantasy that's come since has looked back to the example that 2 set to evolve the series. So no, Final Fantasy 2 is not really that great, but it is absolutely one of the most pivotal titles in the franchise, and I'd even go as far as to say that FF2 is a better game than the first. They're both incredibly flawed and dated in their own unique ways, but that's to be expected from games that are 35 years old now. This game is extremely underappreciated and deserves to be remembered with the exact same amount of respect and reverence that's granted to the original.